Today's episode of This Week in Startups is brought to you by Audible.com, a leading provider of spoken audio information and entertainment. Listen to audiobooks whenever and wherever you want. Visit audible.com slash twist for your free audiobook. And by SnapTerms, online legal protection made simple. Visit snapterms.com and enter the code twist to receive 10% off. And by Amazon Web Services. Get the resources you need to easily get started with AWS Activate, a new global program for startups, including AWS credits, training, developer support, a startup community forum, and special offers from third parties. Learn more and sign up at aws.amazon.com slash activate. Hey, everybody. Hey, everybody. It's This Week in Startups. I'm your host, Jason Calacanis, and this is a show where we talk about technology, and this week we're focused on Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies. It's been a hell of a week uh, and a hell of a year for Bitcoin. We're going to talk about the highs, the lows, the FBI getting involved, and uh, a ton of other nonsense. Stick with us. It's a very important episode. That's what it's all about, man. Hey, shit. Money is the root of all evil. What? Funny how it feeds my people. Yeah. Hey everybody, hey everybody, it's Jason Calacanis, and this is This Week in Startups, the show where we talk about technology, startups, making a dent in the universe, uh, and uh, we're going strong. This is our 407th episode, my goodness. Uh, and if you are new to the show, you can follow at TWI Startups on Twitter, or you can follow me at, at Jason. That's it. Yep, at Jason. I got that handle. That is just straight up bragging. Today on the program, we're going to talk about Bitcoin. We've got three great guests who I'll introduce in just a moment. Want to take a moment and let you know the Launch Festival is coming up on February 24th, 25th, and 26th. And the Hackathon will happen on the 21st, 22nd, and 23rd. The Launch Festival uh, last year had 6,000 people, uh, and we've been doing this conference now for six years. The alumni, Dropbox, Mint, Yammer, Fitbit, Room 77, um, gosh, so many, Red Beacon, Mint, uh, Space Monkey, All Tuition, Boxby, tons of great companies have gotten their start at the Launch Festival, and you can too. Go ahead and apply to launch your startup there, festival.launch.co, festival.launch.co, uh, launch.co, and um yeah, we're going to have 8,000 people this year, which is absolutely fantastic. So today on the program, we're going to talk about Bitcoin. With me uh, back on the program, Howard Lindzen, who is uh, the CEO of Stock Twi Twits. How are you doing, Howard? Uh, I'm taller than you. Well. Taller than me, always uh, not much of an accomplishment, uh, but <laughs> still notable. What's up, Jason? hey -o. Uh But you've been, you've been tracking the Bitcoin phenomenon since the beginning, pretty much. Are, are you an owner of Bitcoin now? Have you ever been, and will you ever be? I have. I've sold uh, all on my blog. I bought some for my kids around 140, started writing about them at 40, and... Uh, Sold them at five sixty, only to see them double again. But I think I think we're uh, on the way down. You think we're on the way down, and we'll get into that in just a moment. We have Tom Longson with us. He is the CEO of Go Go Coin, which does Bitcoin gift cards. So, um, Tom, explain to the audience how does this Bitcoin gift card actually work? Yeah, it's actually uh, it's uh, really cool. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to empower the unbanked around the world, which accounts for about 53% of the world, with Bitcoin. And how we're doing that is with these cards. So what this does is it allows, uh, allows people to be able to buy Bitcoins in a retail setting, something that you can't do today. So we're talking about being able to allow people to get Bitcoin much, much more easily and also be able to use it as a digital wallet to send, receive money. And uh, what we do is we store the, the value of the card in dollars or in local currency. And when the person wants to purchase anything, they do so and it converts on the, on the fly so that you, they can purchase products around the world without having to think about Bitcoin. Ah, and this would also be good for money transfer if I'm you know, living in America, I'm undocumented or something. I want to get money back to my family and I could buy a card and ship it back without having to go through Western Union's ransom. Right. So uh, it's, it's really interesting. The remittance market, basically people sending money from first world countries to third world countries, accounts for uh, uh, an estimate of $410 uh, billion this year by the World Bank. So we're talking about a lot of money that's being moved around the world uh, on a regular basis. And um, so that's a big, big thing that Bitcoin has going for it, is the fact that you can do payments around the world 
without having to pay that eight and a half percent. I mean, people will spend ten bucks to send a hundred dollars cross country. How is that uh, good? I mean, we shouldn't fair have to do that or anymore. sustainable or any of those things. Yeah, right. Just, uh, <laughs> Basically, the poor are getting poorer as a result of this. Absolutely. And uh, Charles Amadeus is with us, who blogs about Bitcoin. How are you doing, Charles? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me, Jason. Now, Charles, what's your story? Are you are you like a Bitcoin super fan? You don't have a Bitcoin company. How, when did you first get involved in Bitcoin? How many Bitcoins do you own? Are you are a speculator? What's your story? Uh, I was a speculator, thinking about it, mostly thinking about it. I've always had an interest in cryptography, um, understanding the whole ecosystem, what it can do beyond a currency is really my focus of interest. Um, contracts are going to change. Voting is going to change. There's a lot of amazing things this protocol can do. Uh, and just changing what we trust and how we trust. So. And That's how it. many Bitcoins do you own? Just so we get this all out of the way here. Uh, do you have ownership? If you tell me what your bank account has. I I'll have no Bitcoin. <laughs> I have no Bitcoin. Zero Bitcoin. Okay, well, you tell me what you have in USD, and I'll tell you what I got in Bitcoin. <laughs> God, <laughs> that. Charles. Okay, Charles but uh, you own, suffice to say. <laughs> all right, how, let me ask you another way. What percentage of your net worth is in Bitcoins? Uh, uh, my risk money. I would say my Vegas 10 money. 10% or Vegas. something? 5%, 10%? It's it's a it's a, a small amount, but it's large enough to mean something if uh, it. if it okay. continues this trajectory. All right, just want to make sure we're, we're clear on everybody. Tom, have you been speculating in the Bitcoin space uh, for some period of time? I have been or speculating. No? Uh, I have invested a lot of my Bitcoins into HowDoYouBuyBitcoins.com, which is a resource for people to buy Bitcoins, huh. as well as uh, GoGoCoin.com, which is my new business. So basically, um, I don't have a huge amount of Bitcoins on hand at the moment, but um, I think it's a great way to, to hold savings. I My savings account loses money uh, year after year. <laughs> so my oh, savings man. is in Bitcoin, and it's worked out great uh, historically, and I'm going to continue to do so. All right, so uh, let's just talk a little bit about what's happened over uh, the last week or so. We've had a ton of stuff go on. Bitcoin dropped 30% or something to that effect uh, when BTC China was forced to stop accepting deposits in Chinese renminbi, that's just their currency. Uh, traditional investors um, have had a pretty wild year, 8,000% rise uh, year over year, and uh, we saw a peak of something like 1,200, 1,300, 1,400, depending on the market. What, what do we think in terms of the massive swings we've seen? Is this something that's going to continue, Howard? Is it going to level off? What are your thoughts? Uh, the volatility is here. I will go, it's got to quiet down for uh, adoption. Uh, so, for the good of everybody, we want to see this. I mean, everybody speculates. I mean, it just depends on your time frame, I guess, is the famous uh, saying. But it needs to calm down for the venture capitalists, for the people that want to use this, like Charlie. Charlie wants to use this in a day-to-day -day life. Uh, we can't have, we can't even have one percent swings uh, for that to happen during the day. And so, obviously, That's we're great. a long way from that. We're yes. a long way from that. But at the same time, I'm extremely bullish on technology solving uh, reduced costs. I mean, let's face it, just quickly, costs have come out of every industry, travel, brokerage, uh, banking. Uh, we've got AngelList. We've got uh, 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 Robinhood, zero commission brokerage. We have travel agent, Priceline. Uh, it's going to happen in, in, uh, in banking and service charges for transferring money. Uh, as he said, $10 on $100, uh, you know, that's just not going to happen. It should be pennies. Um, okay, Tom, you disagree about the fluctuations. You, you think this can become a viable market if it's swinging 20% in a day, 30% in a week, 100%? It's already a viable market. And I can tell you this because I pay for developers. I pay for people to, to do things for me in Bitcoin. And so from an investment set perspective, maybe I'm losing money because I don't have those Bitcoins. But if I, if I buy Bitcoins immediately and then send them to somebody and they exchange them back to their current currency, how is that a, a problem? I mean, we're talking about money that moves so much faster than anything else that the volatility is not important. I mean, my wife owns for, cups and cakes. For that part of the market, Francisco. I agree. For spot market, so, I agree. So, yeah, so my wife owns Cups and Cakes Bakery in the city, and she's more concerned about the volatility of cocoa. So, I mean, <laughs> people talk about the volatility, but we're talking, we're, we've got a, a revolutionary payment system here. So, um, Howard, uh, you uh, agree that in the moment of the transaction, it doesn't matter because it's so fast, but keeping savings in it obviously is not advisable right now or is? 
Oh, I'd you sold. Own, I, I said I sold. I'd rather own Google and Nike uh, for my kids. Uh, when I wrote the post at 140, I wanted them to have the experience of Coinbase of owning a few uh, Bitcoins. But at 560, I said, let's put our money back in Google. And uh, if I ever make my three to four times my money on an investment in three months as I did in Bitcoin, uh, you know, who am I to not take that? Um, you know, the market giveth and the market taketh away is the way I look at things. And uh, I'd rather own something with cash flow. Again, this is no different than gold. Why would I own gold? I don't want to own. What uh, is causing the massive fluctuations, Charles? I mean, it is even uh, between the different um, exchanges, you can see a difference of 10 percent or more. What is the cause of all of this volatility in your mind? Is there somebody just holding on to a ton of Bitcoins, selling them really fast? I mean, obviously, the China thing got people spooked, but th there seems to have been always been just big volatility here. What causes it? No, it's liquidity. I mean, you have something that's currently worth less than $10 billion. That's the entire ecosystem. And there's $10 trillion in global trade happening. So, you know, we there's a long way to go before everyone is using this. And uh, as people rush in and get an understanding and interested, that's going to cause massive spikes. Early adopters will liquidate a little bit to pay bills or buy a Lamborghini or whatever you do with money. Um, and that's going to continue for quite some time. We've got a few orders of magnitude to grow before this stabilizes. All right. I agree with that. I mean, we're talking about a very, very small market if you look at the market cap. Uh, so, I, yeah, $10 billion is a small market cap. Crazy. For what it's reason? crazy. We're talking about something with zero cash flow. So let's not talk about the market cap. I know that we're not talking about digging gold mines in Africa and killing people and the extraction value is uh, less pollutive, no matter what uh, Pando says, than uh, uh, digging up and uh, killing uh, innocent people to get at gold. But uh, I think it's silly to be thinking in terms of market cap. I think what you had, Jason, is a classic uh, case of uh, too much money chasing too scarce an asset. Uh, the excitement of a uh, couple of nerds and Chinese people saying, I'd like to corner the market. And that never works. And now you have the end of someone trying to corner the market. Uh, will the market be cornered again? It's fun. I guess at $10 billion, uh, there's a thousand people in the world that could corner the market and not even notice the money missing in their account. So uh, it's a speculative uh, platform, right? Not a speculative currency, but the platform is real. And I think all this price stuff gets away from what we really want to talk about, which is what Charlie and uh, GoGo Coin all right. are, are offering. Good, se good segue. When we get back, we're going to talk about how Bitcoin will be used 5, 10, 20 years from now, uh, if at all, after these important messages from our partner, which is the wonderful Snap Terms. If you have a website that doesn't have a proper terms of service or privacy policy, you are risking costly litigation. And let me tell you, these litigation firms are the scum of the earth, and they will chase you down and try to take all your angel money and venture capital money and destroy you. But Snap Terms will save you with a simple, affordable, and fast way to protect your website using a proper terms of service and privacy policy. Um, we use it ourselves. Go to thisweekinstartups.com slash legal to see them. They're funny. They're easy to read. And they start at just $2.99. If you were doing it with a law firm, you'd add a zero and then double or triple it. I know because I've been doing this for 20 years, and I have spent that kind of money building terms of services. Go to snapterms.com and enter the coupon code TWIST, and you will get 10% off. And uh, they have been long-term supporters of the program. They're a great, great startup that solves a very... Um, you know, complex problem in a very easy way, and uh, it's simple, it's cost-effective, and you can do it anytime you want. Tons of support. Uh, go ahead and check out snapterms.com. Use the promo code TWIST, as in This Week in Startups, and everybody on their Twitter account, most importantly, say thank you at Snapterms for supporting independent programming like This Week in Startups. Okay. When we left our heroes, we were talking about exactly what, why Bitcoin is important. Um, Tom, what, what do you think is so important about this currency in the bigger picture? Well, I, so the currency in a bigger picture is that we have a technology that basically is disrupting the, the um, monetary system in the same way that Craigslist it disrupted the newspaper system. Um, they're taking something that uh, traditionally has been very expensive and making it almost free. And historically with technology, we see this as creating a huge amount of rapid change 
Um, we've, we haven't seen people making money quite this, the same way since uh, domain names. Uh, and there's a huge amount of uh, technology that's going to come out of this because we're talking about HTTP for money. We're, we're talking about a way to send money in the same way that you can send email and not having to rely on third parties. This is something that Charlie really likes, which is the, the fact that we're changing the way that we, we can do contracts, we can move money, um, how we notarize things. This is a big deal. Uh, well, Charles, what, what do you think is the big picture here? I mean, how will standard citizens be using this currency in five years if it doesn't get banned by governments or have a complete collapse because of, you know, some technological breach you know, or hacking or something like that. If it doesn't have, you know, the black swan moment and it just keeps growing the way it's growing in terms of usage, what would a, what would Bitcoin's role in our daily life be in oh, five years? I, I, I can imagine, you know, getting into my car, which I'm currently leasing from a dealer. And when I turn it on, um, it makes a little payment to the dealer because it uses a cryptographic radio wave that goes to the engine and says, oh, hey, you're making car payments to get in this car. You're good to go. And if I stop making payments, if my Bitcoin address doesn't have enough money, my key will stop working and the guy will come by and repossess the car. It has a way of making the Internet of Things really uh, more concrete and abstract. It takes away the money that we currently use. I think you just terrified half of Americans, and we're never going to talk about now. Well done, Tom. Well done, Charles. No, sorry, Charles. People are like, wait a second, I've been dodging the repo guy successfully for years. Now my car is not going to even start. It's pretty dystopian, if you ask me. Um, but what you're, I think what you're getting at is... Of, that's that's yeah. what I love about Charlie. Uh, he's living this stuff, and this is where the Internet of Things really goes. You know, The Internet of Things, as we keep talking about, is so boring. But the Internet things is the way guys want to live with this, uh, no different than uh, someone using Uber as their second car like I do. Uh, you have to live this stuff to really understand it. Yeah. Uh, and so um, what, what else, Charles? I mean, that's one example, uh, you know, micro payments for stuff that would normally be big considered purchases. What, what else do you think this is going to have an impact on? You talked about contracts before and voting. Yeah, contracts, voting, anything that requires third-party trust can be broken down into this protocol in some way. It hasn't been done yet, but all the tools are in the script. Um, so, for example, right now you trust the NYSC or the COMEX to like manage these trades. Um, you could do that through a blockchain. Uh, MasterCoin, I think, is trying to do that in some way. I don't know if it'll be successful, but people are thinking about this. So let me um, um, just stop you for a second there. For the neophytes in the audience, explain what a blockchain is and, you know, what the you know, sort of table of transactions is and, and how that works, if you were going to explain it to somebody who is just hearing about Bitcoin for the first time. Well, you've got this long string of transactions that have been going on for the last, I guess, four years now. And um, it's kept in this thing called a blockchain. It's a public ledger that's verifiable, verifiable by anyone who wants to look at it. And you can see all the Bitcoins that have been made, who they've gone to, and where they've been sent. And um, this blockchain is made up of what's called a cryptographic hash. There's sort of a trinity of cryptographic things that you have to understand to really get down to the nitty gritty of Bitcoin. Public key cryptography um, came out around the 1970s, I think, Diffie-Hellman. Um, digital signatures and cryptographic hashing. And these things allow for secure payment and irreversible payments. Um, and that's the brilliance of it, because it's not just payment. It's really the verification of information, decentralized information verification. Now, what, um, how would you describe... Uh, the ownership of a Bitcoin. How do you own a Bitcoin first? Again, for a lay person who doesn't understand, how do I own it? I own a number, I own a key. What exactly? I own a file. If I lose my floppy disk or my thumb drive, do I lose the file? Explain this to the, to the citizens listening. It's, it's having a password to an account, basically. Um, you, have a, you have like a string, uh, whether it's your you know, password of numbers, letters, doesn't matter, and it gives you access to move something um, or, or to write to the blockchain. Um, you know, I, I think by way of analogy, we can think of like the print, printing press, the Gutenberg Bible, the Protestant Reformation, right? The printing press is public key cryptography, digital signatures, and cryptographic hashing. Um, the Gutenberg Bible, okay, was the product of these three things in the form of Bitcoin. And out of that will come this reformation of information technology, this way of using tech information in ways that no longer requires a Google or uh, anyone else, really, for that matter. Tom, Tom, is that a good, uh, good enough explanation when you explain it to people in the third world who want to buy 
GoGo Bitcoin gift cards. Do, do they understand what they're buying? And, and how do you explain to somebody they're buying you know, a password to an account that has some numbers in it and the card is purchasable and then you get it and then you can send it? Ex ex how do you explain it to people? I usually like to tr turn this uh, question around and say, well, how does the credit card system work? What happens after you swipe your card? People don't know. They don't care because it's about the utility that they're getting from that card. So in the case of Bitcoin, I try, I mean, everything that Charlie said is true from a technical perspective. Um, that being said, I don't describe it in quite that way to uh, lay people because it's just not, it, it gets confusing, right? So what I would say is that the Bit blockchain is a distributed database so that um, basically what's happening is that a copy of this database is on millions of computers around the world, all verifiable with math, and allows people to basically send money worldwide without having to rely on a third party like a bank. So, so the blockchain is basically all this like cool tech that allows for people to send money from person to person instead of from person to bank to person. How hard would it be for somebody to, in some way, compromise the blockchain? Now, not maybe as a fundamental, but to spoof an attack or something, or confuse somebody's wallet, or confuse some exchange that trades had occurred when they actually hadn't, uh, or, or those kind of things. Is that kind of stuff actually happening, Charles? Uh, there have been attempts, if you will. Um, yeah. There's something called a 51% attack. Basically, if you can control more computing power than 50% of the network, it's possible. Um, but you would need a heck of a lot of computing power. I think the blockchain right now is using like 150 times the computing power of like the supercomputers of the world right now. So it, it'd be pretty infeasible unless um, the NSA tampered with the cryptography that we're currently using, which is not impossible given the revelations <laughs> of Edward Snowden. So. Well, what you, That's uh, actually the biggest threat. Is it really? So let's get into that, Howard. What do you, Howard, what do you think the chances are? I know these other guys are maybe a little bit deeper on the tech side, but just in terms of your experience, you know, uh, in the marketplace, what do you think the chances are that the NSA has their hands into this technology and is in some way participating and or manipulating it? Okay, well, good question, but let's think about it in terms of uh, mom and pa kettle who may want to give 10 to their grandchild and someone who uh, wants to own 5% of their assets. Well, I think if you own, you know what I mean? Is this yeah. going to be something that, uh, and so somewhere in between there, there's two ways to look at this trend. And I'm trying to simplify it because uh, I know Charlie really well, and I know that people that uh, read me, uh, that I've shared Charlie's work with, respect him immensely. That's why I recommended him for your show. But yeah. I look at it like, two ways, in any trend, okay, let's take a tent to the nuts and bolts. It's not so early that Fred Wilson and Mark Andreessen and Chris Dixon are gonna invest, and it's not too late that Warren Buffett thinks it's cool and usable yet. So we're in this, we're in, <laughs> let's think about it in between that terms of a massive piece of pie that's out there that's ready to get tapped, okay? Um, there's affirmation on the early stage and there's denial on the late stage. Where the NSA fits in is always gonna be a wild card. The NSA is a wild card with Google, Yahoo, this show, uh, anything we do. And so they tried to shut it down. They've tried to do different things. The FBI is the largest holder. Guess what? Bitcoins are still trading at 640 something uh, dollars per coin right now. So the cat's out of the bag. All this stuff is just noise. We're gonna have uh, gossip, rumor, etc. But right now price says that people have a lot of confidence that this is something bigger than a zero. And uh, we've also, uh, it's also a little bit too speculative in my opinion, but we're in some meaty All point right. where the, the NSA uh, will not be able to stop this. The NSA right. will not be able to stop this. When we this. get back from commercial break, the FBI has now uh, acquired the biggest Bitcoin wallet in the world. Uh, find out how they acquired it and what they intend to do with those Bitcoins when we get back from this very important message. God, I'm getting good at these goddamn segues. Uh, <laughs> God, I'm really getting good. I could be like a professional broadcaster someday. Uh, but, and wait till you hear this ad read, Tom. You're going to be delighted by this. I'm going to get you to actually use some Bitcoin to sign up for Audible. Audible.com, oh, Audible. It is one of my favorite services on the interwebs. Uh, of course, they provide audiobooks. Of course, I am a platinum subscriber. And I listen to audio books like, uh, it's like a, it's my drug. I am a junkie. I have like hundreds of audio books at this point. And uh, the one I'm reading right now, 
or I shouldn't say I'm reading, I'm listening to, is 36 hours and 42 minutes long. It's the bully pulpit, uh, Teddy Roosevelt, William Howard Taft, and the golden age of journalism. I'm listening to it because I want to learn about journalism and where we came from in history. I think this is a great thing to do as an entrepreneur uh, because you will, of course, uh, be able to apply that to what's happening today, you know, almost 100 years later. And the other one I'm listening to is Chip Connolly, who was just on the program, Emotional Equations. Remember, he was doing all those emotional equations like disappointment is expectation minus reality, all these great things. So go get Emotional Equation and go get uh, Emotional Equations from Chip Connolly. That is my choice of the week. But also The Bully Pulpit is just turning out to be a fantastic book. It's by the uh, woman who wrote, uh, Doris uh, Goodwin. She wrote uh, Team of Rivals, which became the Lincoln film, um, which was absolutely fantastic. Uh, they have 150,000 titles. You can use it on all your different things. iPads, mini, their Androids, blah, 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 blah. Computer, blah, blah, blah. You know all that stuff. You guys are pretty smart. But what you don't know and what you need to know is that you can get a 30-day free trial by going to audible.com slash twist, audible.com slash twist. And... The winner of the iPad Mini that we gave away in the last contest is uh, Fariz Nimri, uh, at Fariz Nimri uh, on Twitter. And uh, you have won this iPad Mini, which I signed and ruined for you. Uh, and just as best at Jason on the back, you can use some uh, rubbing alcohol to take that off if you don't like it. But anyway, congratulations on winning uh, Fariz the uh, iPad Mini. Everybody else, go to audible.com slash twist, audible.com slash twist, and uh, get yourself a free book. What a great company. Everybody thank at Audible underscore COM uh, on Twitter. Uh, and again, Chip Connolly's Emotional Equations and Doris Goodwin's The Bully Pulpit. Are you reading that yet? Uh, anybody? No. Can't say I can. All right, guys, listen. This is why you guys need Audible. Okay, listen to Jason. You sound like a bunch of nimrods now. Who, not even who reading pays any for books. music? You guys, everybody, listen, you're listening. listen, you guys it's have to real. come across as smarter. Read some books, so, goddammit. So you just download and buy Audible with, uh, with Bitcoin now? Yeah, I think you can do it. You sign up for Audible Bitcoin. No, you go get a GoGo Bitcoin card and you then you get <laughs> And there's a little plug for you, huh? See, that's how we do it. Thanks, all right, let's get back to the... i about uh, the NSA listening to my Audible account. Exactly. They're like, oh, my right. God, he's reading Fifty Shades of Grey again. Uh, <laughs> on <laughs> half speed. That's creepy, <laughs> dude. <laughs> you don't have to put it on half speed. Lots of Howard. pausing. <laughs> wow. Howard, that's just a big revelation. Well, somebody somebody tweet that I right more, now. baby. <laughs> Howard listens to Fifty Shades of Grey on Audible at half speed. Go ahead and tweet that. All right. Uh, the FBI now has the biggest uh, Bitcoin wallet in the world that came out because, not because they bought it, but how did they get that? Tom, how did they get this? This is a great story. Um, as a lot of people know, uh, Silk Road was shut down. And uh, I, I applaud that, honestly. I think that they were, uh, it was good for Bitcoin, it was good for digital cash. Uh, and for everybody who in the space who's really trying to uh, legitimize uh, this it was a good thing the problem with it is because uh, they were able to shut down Silk Road and acquire this this huge wallet of bitcoins it now means that the FBI is sitting on a huge amount of bitcoins and if they were to liquidate too quickly it would cause a huge market crash so we're talking about the basically the FBI being able to move the market uh, just as you would if you owned a, a significant portion of gold so so it um, looks like they have 174,000 Bitcoin, and at 670, that's uh, well over 100 million U.S. Is, is this true that the wallet's not encrypted? Is Am I to understand that? Like, do they just physically have the wallet, or can they decrypt it and send out payments? Because that doesn't seem I, clear I, to me. I understand that they have um, gotten the key already, and it's. Uh, I'm. this is pure speculation, but it's possible that uh, the Ross... Uh, the guy who was uh, uh, is being Ulbrich, convicted. Yeah. Thank you. Um, he may have used that as leverage in terms of sentencing. Yeah. It's, it's possible. Okay. Yeah, that's great. It'd be like, hey, give us your bitcoins. We take, you know, a couple of years off your sentence. That's a pretty good deal, actually, for him. Hmm. Uh, if you don't have any choices, <laughs> he's got a pretty big stash in other places. I hear. I hear he's well, got. If not all of his bitcoins, is what I understand. If, so, if he is the actual Dread Pirate Roberts, the alleged, the alleged now, Dread Pirate Roberts. Now, what people misunderstand about using Bitcoin is that people think it's untraceable because <laughs> it's, it's, not. it's anonymous. But it's not, pseudonymous. <laughs> it's not either of those things, is it, uh, Charles? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's as anonymous as like me signing up for uh, Google, you know, 
I can put in whatever email address I want, but it comes back to your IP. There's a way to trace it. Uh, there is a coin called Anon coin, which does have far more anonymous properties because it uses, uh, it's called IPv6, um, and it's, it's significantly more secure. But still, you know, if it's, if it's digital, it's public. There's no right. such thing as privacy when you're dealing with electronics. But so people are clear, your wallet and your transactions are in this chain that you described Forever. earlier. Yes. So Forever, yeah. So every single transaction you made is absolutely verified. So if you were trading Bitcoins with a drug dealer or a drug dealer on Silk Road and people found out your wallet ID, they would know that you bought every Friday night at 1 a.m., Howard. Wait, how'd you know that? <laughs> Howard. <laughs> Every 1, 1 a.m., this Bitcoin's coming out of your account magically, and then again at 4 a.m. What's going on, Howard, down there in San Diego? <laughs> it's how Coronado so you, Island's getting crazy now. You hit a really good point, which is that the uh, original creator of Satoshi, uh, of Bitcoin, uh, Satoshi Nakamoto, uh, can't spend his Bitcoins without potentially uh, giving away his identity, because if he were to spend those coins, everybody would know it, and... The reporters around the world would would converge on wherever he spent them. I mean, if it was a cups and cakes bakery or some other service, they would all be asking this person, "Give us more information. We want to track down this person." All right, so, Satoshi, here's a deal for you. I'll give you fifty cents on the dollar <coughs> for a million <laughs> shares right now, and I'll sign an NDA. Let's go. Um, Satoshi, that's a lot of Bitcoin. He's what got are a the chances? Bitcoin. What are the? Ch I mean, I met Satoshi recently. Um, what are the? Nobody else knows who he is, but what are the chances, uh, Satoshi? is actually a group of people in your minds. Uh, give me a percentage, Very high. Tom. I, percentage. I actually believe that it's uh, pr it's probably one or two people. Uh, primarily, uh, I, I believe it's uh, Nick uh, Savio. Uh, I mean, that's my, my educated guess. I think it's the Rothschild bankers, an alien, and possibly uh, the NSA, because at this point, there's no way to know. <laughs> well, no, but Charles, you, there is going to be a way to tell. I mean, people are start, People will find out eventually who created this, clearly. I mean, nothing can stay a secret forever, I, I don't think, unless the person's dead. Um, but what, that's what do you, possibility. What do you, that is an interesting possibility. <laughs> what do you think, what are the chances this is more than one person? Charlie. It seems pretty high in my mind only because, and I'm not a mathematician, programmer, or cryptographer, for someone to conceive of this. I mean, he is standing on the shoulders of giants, as they say. But uh, this is a very remarkable innovation, and it seems like it would take a group of dedicated people working on it. Uh, How but, long did you think do you think it took for them to make this? Because there were, correct me if I'm wrong, some cryptography, you know, cryptocurrency rather, projects going before Bitcoin, correct? Yeah, I mean, you know, going back to the 70s with public key cryptography, this is sort of emerged from that. Um, but as soon as 1997, I think with Hashcash, uh, that was definitely one of the first real cryptographic uh, currencies. Um, but it didn't have the distributed network that this one has. And so that's the real innovation here is this way to decentralize the exchange to verify that nothing's been spent twice and that no one else is using your coins and impersonating you. Howard, Can I answer that, Charlie? Howard, what do you think? Who created this and why? And when they, who created it? Why? And when they, when the world finds out who this is, what impact would it have uh, on the Bitcoin economy? Uh, it's over my head. I'm going to just go with Charles on this. I'm not going to comment where I don't know. Sorry. Or it could be Mike Arrington, one of the two. Exactly. So, if it, <laughs> exactly. Uh, if it does come out that it's just like two developers. It's Josh Harris. Exactly. If it's two developers, you know, in the Valley who did this, um, it's not. Howard. Okay, it's just two, de not. two developers, you know, who used a Japanese pseudonym, but they're, you know, from somewhere in America, and they're now sitting on Bitcoins that are worth, what, a billion dollars or a half billion dollars? Where is it, Toshi's? He's got a million, so it's, it'd be a, it'd be a tr yeah, 600 million to a, tr 600 billion to a trillion dollars. <laughs> uh, if he's got a million, it would be 600 million to a billion, right? If it goes to a I'm sorry, yes. Th yes. Thank you, thank you. Um, <laughs> Yeah, but well, let's not get ahead of ourselves, but it could go there. So what, how, would, how would that person's, what would be the treatment of that income if the person did sell them? What do you think? How would the IRS look at them? I know you're not an accountant, but is it founder shares in a company? Is it, I mean, how, how do you even account for that? Is it like winning the lottery? How would they look at it and tax it, do you think? I, I can uh, explain this question. Me. I think Goldman solves those type of problems for Satoshi. <laughs> I think those are problems that Goldman solves, not us. Well, who's going to answer, Tom? They probably made it. Yeah, so uh, if you are producing Bitcoins, it's different than if you're buying and selling them. Mm -hmm. If you're buying and selling them, it's just like gold. We're talking about capital gains. Right. 
It's very simple. If you're making them, it's income? Income, yeah. Wow. So you get taxed pretty heavy on that stuff. You better make it a startup company or something. Uh, don't <laughs> sell. Exactly. I don't know how he's going to um, uh, get through with this. So now, what do you think? Uh, let's talk about the government's relationship to all of this. Um, we have China telling financial institutions not to use it, or do we know actually even know what China's exact stance is? Maybe Charles, you've been following this. What exactly is their stance? Because it wasn't perfectly clear, and I know China doesn't usually make its government policies perfectly clear. But, I mean, they do jail people pretty clearly, but uh, what is exactly China's stance on this, do you think? Well, I'm half Chinese, but I don't speak Chinese, so I'm okay. relying on the translations of others. But, you know, all of their edicts come from regional, provincial governments. So right. uh, it sounds like they're trying to slow down massive speculation. It's, it's a gambling-prone culture. And they, they realize how tenuous their financial position currently is with the massive amount of private debt in that country. They don't want rampant speculation in this sector. Um, so they, they want to keep it cool. It might hurt the innovation there, um, but they'll, they'll come around. Uh, let's talk about uh, the U.S. government sort of uh, positions here. Does anybody sort of have ideas around what the U.S. government is going to do what what have they said so far tom have you, you must have been following all this yeah. yeah i'm actually very close to this uh it's it's less the u.s government that's uh that's a an issue than the banks um so ben bernanke wrote a letter uh basically encouraging us uh encouraging the government to be permissive of decentralized currencies if, if this isn't a good signal i don't know what is um uh, they have to, like it's legal for my wife to sell cupcakes for bitcoins it's completely legal there's no issues um, they've been very clear on this. I think China is much, much more restrictive at the moment, and because of their concern about a, an exodus of capital, right? Well, yeah, I mean, it's good. Good point. The U.S. U.S. dollar policy is is, uh, is so weak, like a weak dollar. So uh, that goes with uh, a strong Bitcoin or whatever the hell we're going to call it, bear suits or whatever. And China is the opposite. They're scared. They're scared of the yuan. Uh, appreciating, so it makes sense that they would also put a cap on uh, all this speculation around Bitcoin. So they have a history of doing that. So those are good points. All right, here we go. It's time for our Bing launch of the week. Let me pause for the graphic. Okay, first up uh, in our Bing launch of the week, a look at the biggest startups uh, using and building Bitcoin. Coinbase raised $25 million from Andreessen Horowitz this week. Uh, biggest raise for Bitcoin to date. Most developed company in the space, according to most. 600,000 users are buying and selling uh, through uh, Bitcoins on the, on, the, on the service. However, a customer's $35,000 transaction did not go through this week, and then the price crashed, um, but they charged him the old price if I understand the situation correctly. Um, but now I think they're going to charge him the old uh, price. Uh, that's Coinbase. What do you guys think about Coinbase? And they're being invested oh. in and their PR problem. Yeah, so they, they're an interesting company because they have received the largest investment in the space from Anastri and Horowitz, which means basically next year is the year of Bitcoin investment. All investors are getting on right now. It's, it's a big deal. Um, that being said, Coinbase is in this position of trying to mature to the level of service that a, a bank offers, and they're a startup at the same time. So they're going through growing pains, but they are doing things generally the right way. Uh, Brian uh, of Coinbase has actually refunded me on a transaction that I had a problem with uh, that was $1,000. So um, I have a good faith in them. Um, I believe that they're trying to do the right thing in general, and uh, it's growing pains of any startup. Okay. I think they've got enormous potential because they, they now have money to hire developers and hopefully they don't just become another bank. I hope, hopefully they realize how innovative this technology is because they could get into real, real big changes, financial contracts, smart contracts is what they're being termed in the community, um, smart property, all these other really amazing possibilities. But if they lose their banking relationship, they're in a world of hurt, too. No, they can't lose that. That's, that's their bread and butter right now. But, but they gotta, there's a lot of room to grow. Okay. Uh, serial, serial entrepreneur Jeremy Allaire is the founder, achievement, and 
founder, chairman, and chief executive officer of Circle, Circle.com, tools for merchants to take digital cash payments. They have a wallet for consumers to buy, sell, and store bit, uh, Bitcoins, competitor to Coinbase and BitPay. They raised $9 million from General Catalyst and Excel. Um, and before Coinbase to speak, was the biggest Bitcoin uh, startup. What is Circle's role in all of this? Who knows? They don't have a product yet. They don't. They're they're a concept. They're a beautiful web page with some apparently talented people, but they don't have anything to show yet. So it's going to be a while till we know what their impact is. And, and it's a talent play. It's a talent. I mean, play. Exactly. clearly, exactly. Clearly, they have a lot of talent, and that's why investors dump money in them. Right. They must have some idea of product. Uh, what product they're going to build? They're just not telling anybody yet. Like the same as Coinbase and every other payment processor, though. Yeah, yeah, I these guess companies so. Jim, making tons of money. Jim Breyer is the uh, one of the directors and investors. He's, of course, the famous uh, Facebook investor. And then finally on our startups of the week is Cointerra. Cointerra. Uh, they manufacture mining rigs to help Bitcoins and other currencies. They have $1.3 in seed funding. Yes, a virtual currency. It needs hardware to run on. Uh, and uh, is it worth it now, guys, uh, to actually buy this stuff in order to mine coins? Or is this a waste of time? Well, I, I did just I think, purchase uh, a miner for about fifteen thousand dollars. You spent um, fifteen thousand on a miner. Yeah, I don't go to Vegas, so I was willing to spend it on a miner. And you know, if, if it, I literally consider it a loss right now. If it happens to make money in the future, uh, that'd be great. But and I got to co-locate it. Where 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 are you? Um, what are you um, mining for? Which coins? It, w- it would be for Bitcoin specifically from KNC Miner. Uh, they're based out of Sweden. Um, and you know the idea here is that if this protocol sticks around, assuming that the cryptography is good, um, I'll be able to make a coin a day, um, which would be a pretty good investment. Uh, if it goes back to a thousand bucks, hell, if it stays at three hundred bucks, it goes to doesn't really matter where. Uh, so you can make a coin for a thousand bucks a day with this fifteen thousand dollar machine, which means hey, whatever in thirty days you will pay for it, or fifteen days depending on what the price is. But what would the electricity cost be on something like this? Yeah, this is a lot of speculation. <laughs> so it's a lot of speculation. It's absolutely a lot of speculation. Like I said, I already consider it a loss. If it makes any money, that'll be fantastic. It's just an interesting way to play. Uh, and what about? But it does cost electricity. Oh yeah, you the said, cost you should you need a special location. Yeah, no, it's going to be like 4,000 watts to, to support this sucker. Um, so I'm going to have to co-locate it at a server farm somewhere in Seattle. But, you know, that comes to the territory. You have to put it somewhere where it can actually draw on a very cheap supply of steady electricity, is what you're saying. Well, thankfully, the Pacific Northwest has very cheap electricity. Um, but, like, my miner at home only pulls about 400 watts. And even that occasionally blows out the circuit. Um, and what is it mine? How, how, what, a coin every 10 days, a coin every month? Um, so I actually don't mine Bitcoin directly with my home miner. Um, it's not good on a personal computer anymore because it's gotten way, way, way too hard for the average computer to do. Um, there's a service called multipool.us that will take your computer's work and apply it to the best script coin based upon difficulty and profitability. Um, oh, wow. And so it's sort of, it just points to a coin, starts mining it, and it changes every two minutes. Um, it's Very instantly smart. sent to an exchange called Cryptsy. Um, at Cryptsy, you can trade basically every single alternative coin out there. Um, and if I was interested in liquidating, I would send it to Coinbase after I convert it to BTC. But at the moment, it's just accumulate, see what happens. It doesn't cost much. All right, guys, Dogcoin is going crazy. What, what is Dogcoin? Oh. And uh, I mean, I'm getting like, I know I'm... I'm getting like 10 emails a day from people oh. asking me about Dogcoin, and I know I it's a big put on, but we have to bring it up at some point. So, what, what is Dogcoin? And run out of control. Yeah. Uh, it's the internet, man. It's 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 you know it's this it's built off a meme, but there's a community coming around it, and you know it has all the cryptographic properties of like Litecoin and other real coins, but it's got a real following and a development base. It seems because it's memeable. Um, yeah, so basically what they did is they took, they took an existing application, Litecoin, and changed a bunch of pictures and text and created a new blockchain, basically a new decentralized database, and somehow that's become profitable. Um, and it's based, of course, off of the meme of this. There's a meme of this dog uh, photo. Doggy. Yeah, doggy. Yeah. And uh, it's a Shiba, I guess, and it yeah. looks at you with a certain, you know, sort of... Um, yeah, scary. It's an irreverent ecosystem, yes. and, uh, <laughs> but it's growing. God bless I, them. God it, bless them. You know, it's, it's got to so be. Good. It's it's kind of crazy. I bought a hundred dollars worth of it yesterday because I just thought it was funny. <laughs> um, and I'm basically going to. I'm gonna. If, if Bryce is listening, Bryce, do me a favor. Sell them. 
sell as many as it takes to get my hundred dollars back, and then let the less, <laughs> let the rest ride uh, in a week. But I, I, it seems like um, this could be, you know, to me, a signal that things are are coming to their logical conclusion when people pop up a currency as a joke. Um, so let's add that as our fourth startup of the week, our fourth launch of the week. <laughs> so uh, I would like to ask my guests, <laughs> my guests, to tell me which is the Bing uh, launch of the week: Dogcoin, Cointerra, Dogcoin making a mockery of coins of cryptocurrency, Cointerra selling you ridiculous servers to um, destroy the universe and the environment, and spew carbon monoxide for our silly little crypto you know cryptocurrency game uh circle which is led by jeremy Allaire, but doesn't have a product yet and coinbase which is just bringing down tons of cash which is the biggest news launch of the week who wants to go first howard go uh, it has to be coinbase because it's uh everybody's trying to make it legit there's something there on the table and how legit does an Andreessen horowitz 25 million dollar investment make the, how, what impact does that have on the Bitcoin space? And you're the. I don't know. I mean, they don't probably don't need 25 million right now. I mean, that's the dilemma of uh, Andreessen and Horowitz is they're piling in so much cash, uh, and uh, so the art, a lot of the art is taken out of this business when you get that much cash. So, uh, what do you mean by that? The art is taken out of the business when you have I that think, much cash as a startup. Explain that. I Unpack do, it. Unpack it. Well, did that work out in 99 when you gave a, a startup in relative terms 200 million to get offices and equipment and blah, 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 blah? It's waste. It's, 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 uh, you know, I mean, Andreessen Horowitz, they can, they have to put billions of dollars to work now. When they started out with their first $500 million fund, they wouldn't have put $25 million into Coinbase. So, uh, you know, now, Fred Wilson at Union Square Ventures already had money in the deal, and it was a Y Combinator company that took a lot of time to uh, get people on board. Uh, so, I mean, this is a well, uh, this has been a well grinded out idea, and they have competition at BitPay, by the way. BitPay is very, very, very aggressive competitor in many of what they do. They're different companies, though. I mean, it's, it's so BitPay is a merchant processor only. Coinbase is both a merchant processor. Uh, I mean, they, they were, that's, their merchant processors are second, actually. They first are ability to buy and sell Bitcoins, and that's a huge revenue stream. You think of all the people who are going, hey, I should buy some Bitcoins. They're getting a percentage on that in America. Uh, it's so huge Tom, what is yours, Tom? What is your startup of the week? Uh, I'm going to say Coinbase as well. Okay. And uh, it's because they have the most momentum. Uh, awesome. And um, uh, Amadeus? Uh, I'm gonna have to go doggy coin. I mean, <laughs> it's it's just such a perfect like you know symbol of like the nature of what's going on. Just a couple of guys hanging out, and they built something you know in a couple of days using a silly internet meme, and it's run. I'm not saying they're gonna be here in ten years, you know, but uh, chances yeah. that was done God while these people were smoking weed. Uh, very high. Very high. Very high. Uh, I would say one one percent or uh, one probability. <laughs> exactly. How, what are the chances it was built while Charles was smoking? Weed. Very low, because I do not smoke weed. What are the oh, chances well then, that somebody on the program and or in the control room right now is smoking weed? <laughs> That's what I want to know. All right, listen, uh, let's keep moving um, uh, about where we go from here. Um, Howard, uh, how big of a market is this going to be? Putting aside Bitcoin, but this whole space, you know, what are the chances 10 years from now this is the dominant way people, cryptocurrencies, are digital cash. Digital cash. What are the chances a decade from now it's either a significant double digit percentage of our daily spending of money or the majority? Oh, uh, under 10 percent, it has a chance to somewhere in the three to five percent. Look at Visa and MasterCard. If you could pull up a chart, uh, which you can't because you don't care about stocks. But if you pulled up a chart of the market caps of Visa and MasterCard and you said, if I could take a slice out of a couple businesses in the free world uh, other than Google, who would I go after? Those two motherfuckers. So uh, Visa and MasterCard is super, super big, rich multiples to take after square went after them so i i think the chances are high that enough money will come into this space that we'll see in the one to two percent of transactions happening through this type of platform i'm very bullish very bullish on that all right all right tom uh without using a without dropping a melon farmer on us again um <laughs> tell us uh what are the chances 10 years from now uh what percentage do you think 
uh, or a percentage chance there is that some significant percentage of our daily transactions go through uh, a new currency? I, I think it's very high. I, I would say that, that Bitcoin or some digital cash equivalent is going to definitely take over in terms of size of PayPal soon. Or, and uh, you've got markets like Western Union, uh, MoneyGram. These, these companies are going to uh, be the ones hurt. And so remittance being $410 billion a year, that's a big big area that can be uh, kind of changed. So we're, I would say it's, we're looking at something comparable to gold and silver. Uh, okay, and then Amadeus. I'm just going to call you Charlie Amadeus because it's so much cooler than calling you Charles. Is that okay? <laughs> That's fine by me. Now, did you? Is that uh, your actual name, or did your? I, I was born Charles Amadeus Siegel, uh, but as you can tell, Charlie Amadeus has a bit more. I don't know. Je ne sais Amadeus, quoi. Amadeus, <laughs> Amadeus, Amadeus. Thank you, sir. You, you didn't get um, any but, of that in high school. Uh, but what, what are your what are your thoughts on the well, percentage it's, chance it's, we're going to be using this on a daily basis in ten years? It's quite possible that consumers who go to Starbucks won't realize that Bitcoin is being used, but that all the financial attractions, transactions in the back end are using Bitcoin. So you might not realize that your card is a Bitcoin card or that's being converted into Bitcoin at some point. Um, but as my you know, dystopian dis uh, description of, of the car payments uh, happens like that, these things are going to arise. The stock exchange could be done in Bitcoins. You're going to see um, you know, Kickstarter. The whole assurance contract yeah. concepts could be done in Bitcoins. And it's currently programmable into the blockchain. Like, we just need a programmer to do it. Um, so you might not realize you're using Bitcoins, uh, is, is what I kind of imagine. All right. Let me um, ask a final question here. Chances that Bitcoin completely collapses, as defined as, you know, under $100 a share in the next year, on a percentage basis, give me a specific percentage, everybody play along with the game. Chances the currency collapses, uh, Howard? Under, under $100, uh, 40% chance. 40% chance in the next year it could be under $100. Tom, what is your percentage chance that it, it dips down that low? I would say five. Um, and I believe that, that Bitcoin is uh, possibly going to evolve to another protocol, another name, but digital cash is here to stay. Ah, so let me ask you that as a follow-up question there. Um, what are the chances that Bitcoin is the you know, first cryptocurrency up the hill, but that there's another one coming that you know, basically fulfills the mission of Bitcoin? Very likely. Litecoin uh, is a competitor, and so Bitcoin has a hard limit of seven transactions per second at the moment, mm -hmm. and that can obviously can evolve, but Litecoin, which is a, this competitor, can do 20 a second as a hard limit. So that's a big deal in terms of, like, you want to use the best technology for moving your money, right? Hmm. Makes sense. Now, uh, okay, and then going, uh, Amadeus, what are your thoughts that the, the currency well, dips under $100 next year? Because this is something people who are speculating want to know. I think that you know, if you look at the price history of Bitcoin right now, at least in USD, um, you've seen at least two 80% corrections from 30 down to $2 at one point uh, back in 2011. Uh, and recently this year from 266 down to like $50. Um, so if our recent top is around 1200, a run to 200 is completely feasible. Um, below 100, that would surprise even me, um, but nothing's impossible if the Federal Reserve starts raising interest rates and stops bond repurchase programs and liquidity dries up in USD. That's going to happen. It's like any other asset denominated in greenback. Uh, and what do you think? Uh, that's why I said 40%. I think, you know, they're subject to the same risks at the stock market times two. And I think we exactly. could have a 20% correction in the market. So 40 is pretty conservative. So you believe, and let's end with that, Howard, um, stock market on quite a tear. I think today was up another 1%. We're hitting all new highs. Um, is it sustainable? I mean, it's been quite a run the past year or two, and you've been on the program for the past year or two, you know, talking about, hey, we're going to have a big bull run. Is this the end of it in your mind? Uh, we're at the beginning of a massive boom uh, still. Um, you have uh, accommodating government. Uh, I'd, again, I don't like predicting stock market prices. Right. You know, I'm very bullish on Google. I'm very bullish on uh, 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 Nike. I'm very bullish on certain companies' price. Uh, you know, there's just going to be a lot of volatility, is what I say, as leaders get disrupted by technology again, like Bitcoins, uh, affecting Visas, MasterCards, uh, banks. But I'm very bullish on financials. I'm very bullish on investing as you are, and, but I don't predict prices. I think that's silly. Do you silly. think the MasterCards, Visas, and the other financial institutions 
uh, will, I mean, obviously they should, but will they embrace cryptocurrency or will they just, like the music industry, sort of put their fingers in their ears and just go la 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 until all of a sudden they start, you know, crashing and burning? I think it's like he said, I think it's like Tom, Tom said that uh, it's in the background, right? Like you may not, or, or Charles said, you may not even know you're using it and there'll be a de visa pay Bitcoin card. So I don't know. I'm, it's a little over my head. I apologize. Guys, what do you think? Can I speak to that? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So uh, I'm very close with the, the companies that are, are trying to, to get banking relationships, uh, including Trade Hill. They, they lost their banking relationship and they have had to close down since then. So banks are basically taking the conservative approach, which is no. And so uh, I'm very happy to have banking relationships uh, still. I know a lot of people in the Bitcoin community who have, who have had their personal accounts closed. Um, so really the banking industry is going to continue this until somebody makes a lot of money off of it. We're going to see banking without banks someday. And uh, I know that a lot of banks are trying to patent their own cryptographic currencies. So they're interested in the technology, but they might not like how free and decentralized it is. All right. Uh, yeah. Listen, this has been an amazing program. Thank you so much, uh, Howard, for being on the program. Any plugs for Stock Twits? Any good things going on there that the public should know about? Yeah, yeah thanks. Stock Twits is growing faster than ever. We, obviously, the market helps. Uh, we've uh, we've been uh, we got to profitability in the last quarter. Uh, we have a new CEO starting in January. Uh, we just completed a confidentially. Uh, you can, can hear it first. A small financing, and uh, uh, you know, growing. To, it's just a lot of fun. Obviously, we love what we do, and we built up. It's really been hard to build a vertical social network per se, but uh, it's going well. And so people know, if you ever see the dollar sign G-O-O-G -O -O -G in Twitter, that was an innovation that StockTwits um, either came cash up with. Tag. The cash tag, we came up with that. Yeah, yes. the cash tag um, uh, they came up with. And here you can see when you look at Google, all the different members of the community having their tweets pulled in. Or maybe it's its own. Is it its own system or is it that's pulling in the tweets, right? So, uh, we, we don't pull in from Twitter anymore because of the terms of use. So now 80% of the dollar sign messages don't even see the light of day on Twitter. Huh. So it's a separate platform. Ah, well, that's great. And Tom, any plugs for uh, GoGo Bitcoin? It's if I wanted to buy these for my uh, family in the third world? Yeah, so we're currently uh, in our seed round. We just started. And uh, I would recommend anybody who's interested in finding out more to check out us on AngelList. We're GoGo Coin um, and easy to find. Uh, so that would be angel.co slash go go coin, I'm guessing. Yep. And there it is. And I'm not logged in, so I can't see the exact investment. But uh, everybody take a look at that. I will follow that. And uh, Char you. Charlie Amadeus, give us a plug. Uh, free Software Foundation. Um, Eben Moglin, uh, people who care and understand how the ecosystem is evolving. Are you uh, on the Twitter? Richard Stallman. Are you on the I'm Twitter? I'm on Twitter, yeah. You can check me out at Charles Amadeus. Uh, well, Twitter, everybody yeah. follow Charles, Charles Amadeus. I'm following him, and there's a lot, a lot of good stuff going on there. Uh, thanks again, Brandis, uh, producer Gina, of course, Jade Killing It on the Launch Festival, Emily, DeMont, Luke, Simon, Brandon, all these great people working at the launch uh, company. And welcome, welcome, Andrew, to the Launch Ticker. The Launch Ticker, uh, you can follow at Launch Ticker on uh, Twitter, which is my private researchers now available to you. Uh, you don't have to read the news anymore. You can just read the private daily briefing that I get uh, is now available to you for 100 bucks a year, 10 bucks a month. And basically, you just can go from reading two or three hours of tech news a day to reading the summary in 20 minutes, and you will be smarter and free up an hour or two for just 10 bucks a month. Go to launch.co and follow Launch Ticker. Uh, of course, you can follow me at Jason and give producer Gina a hard time. She's at G-D-E-L-V-A-C. V -A -C. G -Del -Vac. G D E L V A C. Uh, give her your suggestions, etc. Thanks so much, Snap Terms. Thank you so much, Audible, and thank you. Bing, bing, bing. Uh, what a great, uh, what a great uh, group of partners allowing us to do this awesome show. And we will see you again next time on this week in startups.